Amen. Amen. Our sermon passage this morning will be Ezekiel chapter 20. I will begin reading in verse 18. <coughs> and then I said to their children in the wilderness, Do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor keep their rules, nor defile yourself with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And keep my Sabbath holy that they may be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. But the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes and were not careful to obey my rules, by which if a person does them, he shall live. They profaned my Sabbath. Then I said I would pour out my wrath upon them and spend my anger against them in the wilderness. But I withheld my hand and I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nation, in whom sight I had brought them out. Moreover, I swore to them in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the nation and disperse them through the countries, because they had not obeyed my rules, but had rejected my statutes and profaned my Sabbath, and their eyes were set on their father's idols. Moreover, I gave them statutes that were not good, and rules by which they could not have life. And I defiled them through their gift and their offerings up of all their firstborn, that I might devastate them. I did that, that they might know that I am the Lord. Therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, In this also your father blasphemed me, by dealing treacherously with me. For when I had brought them into the land that I swore to give to them, and then whenever they saw any high hill or leafy tree, there they offered their sacrifices, and they presented the provocation of their offering. There they sent up pleasing aromas, and there they poured out their drink offerings. I said to them, What is the high place to which you go? So its name is called Vama to this day. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Will you defile yourselves after the manner of your fathers, and go whoring after detestable things? When you present your gifts and offer up your children in fire, you defile yourself with all your idols to this day. And shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, declares the Lord, I will not be inquired of by you. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we would ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our Rock, our Redeemer, and our nearest kinsman. Amen. 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 You may be seated. In our current section of the book of Ezekiel, one of the things that he is doing is making the case of the justness of God's destruction of Jerusalem. The people who are in exile with Ezekiel are people who are hoping for a time in which they can return and go back to their own old home and their old life, back to their own idolatries and their old ways of living. Ezekiel is making the case to them that their old lives are gone. That Jerusalem, as they have known it, will soon be gone. By the time God is done, there will be no question that Jerusalem deserved to be destroyed. And the way Ezekiel is doing that is by taking a rhetorical hammer and destroying, one by one, Israel's delusion. He is smashing to pieces their delusion with the word of God. Last week we saw that he had taken a hammer and he had destroyed the idea that they can blame their sufferings and their judgment on their fathers and therefore push their own responsibility away from themselves. He had taken the hammer of God's word to the delusion that they believed that they were God's beautiful bride and therefore they deserved no suffering. He took their hammer to the idea that, well, God made a covenant with David, therefore no matter how wicked we get, 
the line of Cain will just last forever. He took a hammer to the idea that they were a beautiful and fruitful vine that will fill the earth with the blessing that come from being God's vine. Instead, what Ezekiel had shown them the last few weeks is that they themselves are responsible for their own sin and judgment. That instead of being God's beautiful bride, that they instead have become depraved harlots. That that line of king that God had covenanted with will soon, because of their wickedness, be cut down and destroyed, both literally and figuratively. And that instead of being a fruitful vine that is filling the earth with their good fruit, that rather they are a fruitless and useless vine, good only for burning. And in terms of where the book of Ezekiel is going, Ezekiel is really ramping up to the, ex uh, to the climax of the first half of the book. As I'm reading through Ezekiel, it seems like the pace is picking up a little bit, that he's getting more intense with his vocabulary, more intense with his imagery and what he is saying, how he is presenting the truth to Jerusalem, and he's really, or to the exile, and he's really ramping up to chapter 24, where he will receive word that the end has begun. He received word from God that Nebuchadnezzar has surrounded his armies around Jerusalem and that their destruction is good as guaranteed. And by the time we've reached that point, because what the way Ezekiel is working at this point, by the time we get to chapter 24, the reader is almost at a point of finally. Finally this has happened. Finally God's ju judgment is coming upon Jerusalem. And just if you want to know, in terms of our sermon series, next week we will be covering chapters 21 and 22. The following week we'll cover chapter 23. And then on the first Sunday of Advent, we will cover that destruction of, of Jerusalem in chapter 24. And then through the rest of Advent, through the rest of Christmas, we will uh, do something else. And then in January, we will come back to the book of Ezekiel. And so a couple weeks ago, when I preached on the end of the Kings, I briefly covered chapter 19. So chapter 17 is a, is a picture, a parable about this vine and eagle, if you remember that. And the idea was that the uh, Israel's king were going to be destroyed. And then in chapter 19, if you flip over 18, in chapter 19, it's a poetic lament. It's a, a song of lament about the destruction of the king. In a similar way, chapter 20 is actually connected to chapter 18 that we covered last week. Last week we saw that the exiled generation believed and thought and justified themselves because they had said all of our suffering, all of our sins, all, all of our judgments rather, are not due to our sins. It is not our fault, but rather God is judging us simply because of our father's sin. So we are simply receiving the curse that our fathers deserve. And if you remember, Ezekiel gave us an illustration of a three-generation family. Right? If you remember, the first generation, the father was righteous. The second generation, the, the son was sinful. And the third generation, his son was once again righteous. And the point in chapter 18 is that each person is responsible for his own life, his own sin, his own righteousness. Each of these men would live or they would die according to their sin or righteousness. Here in chapter 20, we see a very similar dynamic playing out, but this time Ezekiel is pointing out that the sons are just as rebellious as the fathers. That yes, they are not being cursed, and yes, they are not being judged because of their father's sin, but he is pointing out to them that you present generation of exiles, you present generation of Israel, are being judged because you are just like their fathers. You are following in their footsteps, you are following in their rebellion, like fathers, like sons. When we begin looking at our text, you see a time stamp. In the seventh year, that's the seventh year of Jehoiakim's exile, on the fifth month, on the tenth day. Now that might not mean much to you, but if you remember, we've seen two timestamps before. In chapter 8, that is when Ezekiel receives that vision of Jerusalem. That happened about a year before this. 
And at the very beginning of the book, when Ezekiel is by the waters of Jabbar and he receives that vision of God where God comes to him in a chariot, that is about two years before this vision. So really, everything that we have seen in the book of Ezekiel, all the visions that he has done, all the preaching that he has done, all the activity that he has done has happened in about a two-year time. And so once again, in chapter 20, just like in chapter 8, what we see is that the elders of the people, the leaders of the exiles, come to Ezekiel to inquire about the Lord. And what's interesting, in the book of Deuteronomy, there is a warning of exile. He said, you know, basically saying, when you get into the land and when you become sinful, when you become rebellious, God promises that you will go into exile. But then in Deuteronomy 4.29, it says this. But from there, in exile, you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him. If you search after him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. So perhaps one of the things that these elders, these leaders of the people are doing is that they know this text from Jerusalem, from Deuteronomy. They understand that, hey, or they believe that, hey, all we have to do is simply do a little bit of searching for the Lord. And the Lord promises that we are going to be found. All we have to do is seek him and he will be found. And so they go before Ezekiel and they believe that, hey, all we have to do is go before this prophet and we will fulfill the conditions that God has set down. If we go and present ourselves to the prophet, then God has to answer us. And so they came inquiring of the Lord, but the Lord responds to through Ezekiel. And he asks them a rhetorical question. Shall I really be inquired of by you? Because they had come thinking if we can just outwardly fulfill these obligations, all we have to do is seek and God will be found. But the point is that these men do not come and search after me with all of your heart and all of your soul. Rather, these elders that have come seeking after me are coming and seeking me with heart and with soul that are divided between me and between idols. And so God is asking, do you really think that I am going to answer your inquiry? As I live, I will not be inquired of by you. And so instead of answering their question that they bring before Ezekiel, and in fact, Ezekiel just dismisses it in a way that he does not even record what they are asking about, God gives them the information that he wants them to have. He tells Ezekiel, he says, You, O oh man, judge them. You, O oh man, are the lawyer bringing the accusations against these elders. And the way he brings these accusations is he once again gives them a illustration, but this time it is a history lesson, a story of Israel's history in three generations. If you're looking at chapter 20, you'll see in verses 5 through 10, he is talking about the generation that lived in Egypt at the time of the Exodus. In chapters 11 through 15, he tells of their children, that children that went out into the wilderness. And then in verses 18 through 23, he tells of their children, the children who would be born in the wilderness and enter the land. But the story of each generation follows the same pattern. And it begins, the pattern that he is telling, each generation begins with grace. That's important to see that each generation begins with a fresh revelation from God. That God comes to them and reveals himself to them. Look at the second half of verse 5. On the day that I chose Israel, I made myself known to them in the land of Egypt. And I swore to them, saying, that I am Yahweh your God. I swore that I would bring them out of the land of Egypt and into the land of milk and honey, the most glorious of the land. And so each generation, the story of each generation begins with God's grace and God revealing himself to them. And then the second thing we see in each generation is that because of that grace, he calls the people to devote themselves to him. Look at verse 7. He says, therefore, cast away the detestable things that your eyes feast on and do not defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. So God comes to them in his grace. 
calls them to devotion, but then in each generation, their response is one of rebellion. Look at verse 8. They rebelled against me and were not willing to listen. None of them cast away their idols. And then in response to the rebellion of each generation, God threatened the wrath. Look at verse 8. I said I would pour out my wrath upon them and spend my anger against them. But then in each generation, for God's own namesake, he withhold judgment. Verse 9. I acted for my name's sake that my name should not be profaned in the sight of the nation. And so God is angry upon, with his rebellious people. God is wrathful against them. But because of his name, because of his honor, because his glory is at stake, instead of pouring out his full wrath and destroying his people, each time he brings a limited version of judgment. We see this in verse 10 where he says, rather than destroying them, he brings them out of Egypt into the wilderness. We see the same thing in each of the other two generations. In the second generation, he reveals himself through the rules and the statutes that bring life. He challenges them to keep the Sabbath. They rebelled against his rules. They rebelled against his laws. They rebelled against the Sabbath. He threatens again to pour out his wrath, but rather he judges them by not bringing them into the land. And we see in verse 18, beginning of verse 18, we see the same thing in the third generation. He reveals himself once again as Yahweh their God. He calls them to obedience. He calls them to keep Sabbath. But the children rebel, verse 21. God threatens his judgment, but rather for his name's sake, he promises that he will scatter them among the nations. And so here we have a story of three generations, a story of God's grace and God's mercy and God's character, Israelite unfaithfulness in the, in the face of that grace. In each generation, we see God's grace in choosing Israel, in being merciful to Israel, in, in, just, uh, sorry, in revealing himself to Israel. In each, in, in each consecutive generation, what we should notice is that God comes to them anew. That God does not simply rely on his past revelation of himself. He doesn't just say, well, I revealed myself to your fathers and grandfathers. But God comes to them with a fresh revelation of himself. Each generation is confronted with the reality of who God is and what he has done. And so each generation is responsible for responding to God and his grace. And in each generation, what we see is rebellion in the face of that grace. What the response to grace should have been thankgiving, should have been, yes, if you are the God who redeemed us from Egypt, if you are the God who is giving us laws that lead to life, then the response should have been grateful and obedient living. But rather, in each generation, the response was rebellion. And notice that rebellion is not described in general terms. But really, the way we describe rebellion in this passage is that they go and do the very things that God has told them not to do. So it doesn't just say generally the people rebelled, but it says God told them to cast away idols. They did not cast away idols. God tells them to follow the rules that lead to life, and they reject the rules that lead to life. God tells them to honor his Sabbath, and they profane the Sabbath. The way this is presented, that they are doing the very thing that God tells them not to do, is that it leads us to uh, see and understand that this is a high rebellion, almost infantile rebellion. Right? It is like telling a very young child, hey, don't do that, and they look at you and go and do it. I'm sure you guys never had that happen in your house. I'll just use my illustration. My mom would tell me, I was the kind of kid that she would say, Jared, don't touch the lamp. And I would look at her and put one finger on the lamp, right? Just straight up rebellion, straight up going against what your parents told you simply because your heart is bent towards rebellion. And I think that's part of the point that uh, we should see in Ezekiel. 
that rebellion is not just evil, it is not just wicked, but also it is foolish and it is infantile. That God has, what has God done? God has laid out before his people the way of life, but yet because of the people's rebellious heart, they said, no, we'll do it our way, which is the way of death. And so it's only always important to keep in your mind that rebellion, that sin, is not just evil, it is not just wicked, but sin is always completely and utterly foolish. God says to us, this is the way of life, and we think, no thanks, I'll do it my way. And you'll notice in this passage, there is a particular emphasis on the Sabbath. Sabbath was a covenant sign, a sign of Israel's unique calling in the world. It was a sign that they had been delivered from slavery because sl slaves are not able to take a day of rest. It was supposed to be a sign that all their trust was in God, that they don't need to, to grind out working each and every day in order to provide for themselves, but rather they were to trust, they were to rest in the fact that God was their provider until they could spend one day in worship of him and of rest in him because their lives on, are not their own. And so when they abandon the Sabbath, when they profane the Sabbath, what they are doing is they are abandoning and they are profaning a major part of what it means to be God set apart people. To profane the example of work and rest that God had given them in creation. To reject the freedom that God had delivered them out of Egypt into and they are rejecting God as ultimate provider. And when we look at this downward cycle of three generations, it really all culminates in verse 25, where we should be quite shocked at what we see. In verse 25, God's final punishment upon the people is he removes the good rules, he removes the good laws, those rules and laws that bring life, and he gave them over to rules and laws that were not good. He removed the laws that gave life and rather gave them laws that brought death. And what that means is in the next verse we see that what God did is he gave them over to his idols so completely, so totally, that they were offering their children up in sacrifice. That God said, if you guys want to reject me, if you guys want to reject the way of life, if you want to reject worship of me, then you can have your idols, you can have your ways of death, and it is going to cost you the very lives of your children. We have seen that the people have turned from the ways of life to the ways of death. When we get to verse 27, just in case Ezekiel's hearers are sitting there listening and they're thinking, well, that's a nice history lesson from a long time ago, but it has nothing to do with our life to get today. In verses 27 and following, he brings it up to date. Not only was the Exodus generation wicked, but rather when I brought them into the land, when they settled the land of Israel, they brought that same wickedness, that same idolatry with them all the way to the present moment. And then when we get to verse 31, he brings it home particularly to those elders who have came to sit in front of him. He says this story is not a history lesson from long ago, but this is their story. This is who they are. He says to them, you present your children to the fire. You defile yourself with idols, and yet you would dare come and inquire of me. And so the story is not a story of their fathers. It is not a history lesson, but this is their story. Each generation received a call to not be like the father. Each generation received, hears again, that I am Yahweh, your God. Each generation uh, hears God tell them, follow me, walk in my ways, walk in my rule, walk in my path of life. But each generation consecutively has rejected that path and walked in wickedness. And so we should see, if we're thinking about our sermon last week and connecting it with chapter 18, that these, the present generation is not punished for their father's sin. But rather, they are punished because they are rebellious just like their father. 
So that's an important distinction. They are not cursed because of their father's sin, but rather they are judged because they are just like their father. They have watched their father walking in the sin, and they have walked in the same way. They have not rejected their father's ways. Like fathers, like sons. And what is the answer to this generational cycle? What is the answer when the son choose to walk in sinful path of their fathers? The question I think that Ezekiel's uh, hearers must ask is, will God abandon his people? Can God ultimately just hand the people over to their sin? Look at verse 33. As I live, declares the Lord, Surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. So this is both good news and hard news. The good news is that God will act again. God will put an end to the cycle. God will put an end to this history. God will give his people a new start, a new exodus. And what he does is he brings the people out of the nation for their exile. He brings them out. He's going to take them home. But before he takes them all the way back home, he takes them into the wilderness. He there enters into judgment with them. He there disciplines his people. He there brings his people under the rod, Ezekiel says. He there punishes the wicked. And he does all of this so that in verse 40, he can bring them anew to his holy mountain where they will serve him. So he is going to bring his people out from the exile. He is going to bring them into judgment. He is going to punish the wicked for the purpose so that he can bring a renewed people to offer renewed worship once again on God's holy mountain. And later on in, in this chapter, he says that when these people come once again to this new and holy mountain, they will be a people who have become ashamed of their sin. They will loathe themselves for the evil that they have committed. And they will be a people who shall know that the Lord is God. And so the answer to this downward cycle, this generational of father, like fathers, like son, is a new exodus, a new testing in the wilderness, and a renewed worship of God. And in terms of Israel's history, just 70 years after Ezekiel writes this, God did bring his people out of exile. He brought them back into the land of Israel. He renewed worship with them. But we can see that not all of God's promises are here fulfilled. Because when we turn to the pages of the New Testament, particularly in John 8, Jesus is telling the Pharisees, we can think of them as the elders of the people in Jesus' day, that they were people who were just like their father. They were telling Jesus that, hey, we have Abraham as our father. We, we walk in his way. And Jesus said, if you had Abraham as your father, you would know who I am and what I have come to do. But he tells them in, in one way they are right, that the Pharisees, that they are just like their father. But their father is not Father Abraham, and their father is not even the rebellious fathers of the Exodus in the wilderness, but rather he tells them that you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. The Pharisees, the leaders of the Jews of Jesus' day, have, have continued this downward cycle to the point where they weren't just following their rebellious father, they were not just engaging in a simple rebellion of idolatry, but they were following Satan in his murderous and lying heart. And so they were lying about Jesus and seeking to murder him. But Jesus came into this further rebellion, into this rebellious generation in order to do what? In order to bring to us that final revelation of God and his grace. He had come to be a fuller revelation than the revelation that God gave Moses in the law, a, a fuller revelation that God has given us in the prophet. Jesus has come to reveal himself anew, afresh to us, each and every generation, as very God of very God. And it is Jesus who will go literally into the wilderness to be tempted just like Israel. 
But Jesus does not turn from the word and the rule of his Father. Jesus does not turn from the words that give life, but Jesus follows his Father's word, follows his Father's rules. And despite having no rebellion in his own life, God would enter into judgment with him. If we look at verse 37, we will see that it is ultimately God's Son that passed under the rod of punishment so that God would bring us, his people, into the bond of the new covenant that is made with Christ's blood. And it is when we look at the brutal truth of the cross, we see the truth that our rebellion was so hard, our rebellion was so great, that God became man, he became the one righteous and innocent man in history, and that one God, innocent man, needed to hang on the cross for us. When we look at ourselves from that perspective, then we, God's people, should be driven to loathe ourselves and our sin. When we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, we know the great cost of our sin, and at the same time, we know again, each and every generation, that God is the Lord. When we look at that cross, we should learn to hate our sin and turn from our sin to once again offer right worship and service of God in the mount, on the mountain of God. And so seeing how these promises that God would bring a people back from Exodus, bring a people back from sin and exile through the, the punishment of his own son, his own son going under the rod of God so that we could learn to hate our sin and turn from it, when we see this revelation of God's grace made anew, then we are left with a major challenge in this passage. In the face of God's full revelation of himself in Christ, in light of the love of God revealed in the cross, in light of the ugliness of our sin and rebellion, the question in verse 30 comes to us once again. In light of all of that, will we defile ourselves like our fathers? Will we continue to hang on to those things that God hates. The same challenge is given to us in verse 39, where Ezekiel tells the people, go and serve your idols if you will not listen to God. But God's purposes will stand. God will have a new people that will worship him throughout all the earth, and the choice is yours, whether you will join that people in right worship of God, whether you will serve God and honor God, or if not, then go and give yourself to your idol if that's what you want. You can be part of what God is doing in the world, or you can cling to your foolish idols. The choice is yours. And so we are left with the same choice as Israel. The only difference for us is that we, God's people, on this side of the cross, have received the fullness of God's revelation. We understand the love of God, the grace of God, the wrath of God more fully and more clearly in the face of the Son of God, particularly as he ha hangs nailed to the cross. And this Son of God demands that we follow him, that we believe on his name, that we share in his cross, that we hate and kill our sin, that we worship and serve him exclusively. And so our question that this passage leaves us today is will we walk in his ways that bring life or will we foolishly cling to our rebellion in the way of death? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask that we would be made into a people that cling to your word, that cling to the ways of life, that cling to the death and resur resurrection of Jesus Christ. May we be a people who are always found in him, for in him is life. In his name we pray. Amen.